There's lots of discussion about the types of diversity in the world and in the workplace today. But the one, one that is maybe the most obvious isn't talked about or maybe focused on as much as it could be or maybe should be. And that's our focus today. We're talking about today about the diversity in generations and specifically how we can make that make those different generations on our team a competitive advantage. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders grow personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you're listening to this podcast, you could be live with us for future episodes, as some are right now, uh, and you can interact with us. And obviously, if you're here with us live, you can see them or hear them sooner. And you can do that by joining our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn or remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook. When you do that, you can join us sooner. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by our new book, The Long Distance Team, Designing a Team for Everyone's Success. You can learn more about that book at longdistanceteambook.com. And now I'm going to bring in our guest, and you will see his smiling face. Uh, oops. Now you can see his smiling face. Let me introduce Dr. Tim Elmore to you. Uh, Tim is the founder and CEO of Growing Leaders, an Atlanta-based nonprofit organization created to help develop emerging leaders. His work grew out of 20 years serving alongside John Maxwell. Elmore has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, USA Today, Psychology Today, and has been featured on CNN's Headline News and Fox and & Friends to talk about leading multiple generations in the workplace. He's written over 35 books, including Habitudes, Images That Form Leadership Habits and Attitudes. Uh, one of my favorites, The uh, Eight Paradoxes of Great Leadership, and his latest book, and the reason it's here today, which is A New Kind of Diversity, Making the different generations on your team, a competitive advantage. And so Jim, excuse me, Tim, welcome. So glad that you are here, sir. Kevin, I agree. I'm glad to be here. I've read your stuff on LinkedIn and I thought I got to meet that guy one day. So this is fun for me as well. And so we got people from Pennsylvania and Halifax, Canada and uh -huh. India and Ethiopia. So we got like three, we got three continents going here. There Tim. you go. Uh, yeah. And guess what? There are different generations on all of those continents. Uh, <laughs> That's so right. How about we? And now we got someone saying hello to you. Maybe it's someone that you know. I don't know. Um, all right. So uh, let's start here. I like to sort of give people a chance to get a sense of yeah. what led you to this work. So let's just start there. Sort of what led you to doing this work. Uh, you and I talked about that a little bit in the before we started. But yeah, why this stuff? Well, I began teaching students 40 plus years ago, believe it or not. And I, even though I was still a part of the emerging generation, I fell in love with working with young people. I thought, boy, if you want to shape the world, shape the emerging generation. Along the way, I started working with John Maxwell. And of course, John is this leadership guru. So my love of young people and my love of leadership got married. And by 2003, 20 years ago this year, um, I launched Growing Leaders where I was able to really focus my attention on the younger generations as they enter the workforce, as they move from backpack to briefcase. But Kevin, here's what led to the book. I began to see that we who are part of the older generations were getting more frustrated than connected to the emerging generations because that gap keeps getting wider between Gen Z, this young teammate that's on our team, and the baby boomers, perhaps, that are still leading the way, that are 63 years old. So I wanted to find a way to build bridges rather than walls and really help every generation get the most out of each other. So th that sort of leads you to thinking about this idea of generational diversity. And I have to tell you that certainly lots have been written about the different generations. Yeah, yeah. But uh, when I got this book uh, in the mail, when when you're when your PR firm was pitching me to have you on, uh, I, I just thought the title was exactly right, you know, to really think about it in that regard, in that way. Uh, one of the things that I, you know, here's the thing, you and I are roughly in the same generation, although my hair shows it much more than yours does. And, <laughs> but the good news is we both still have hair. Obviously. Yes, that's right. So, yes. so uh, but one of the things, you know, I, I find that whoever is, whoever is reading it, is reading it from their own point of view. 
Right? Yeah, so I was very right. aware that I'm re reading it as one of these people at the very, not in the oldest of the living yeah. generations, but ne soon to be yes. among the oldest of the, those in the workforce. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that struck me early, and I think it's worth us spending a little time on, is this idea of the personalities. That's how you framed it. Yeah. The personalities yeah. of the generations. So without going into all the details of each one, like what are the things, what are the things that are the factors that you would say lead to the personalities of the generations? Yeah. Well, our brains work and develop a little bit like wet cement. So just like you can put your handprint in a fresh square of wet sidewalk or whatever, the same day it's being laid, but you can't do it a year later. Um, our neural pathways are very pliable. Very, the plasticity is very high early on, and they harden, in a sense, over time. It's not that you can't change at 45 or 50 years old, but it may take a jackhammer just like it does for that sidewalk. So I found that as each new generation comes in, there is a vocabulary they bring with them. There are strengths they bring with them. Uh, and even though all of us don't think exactly alike in a generation, just like all personalities are different, there is a narrative based on the shared tragedies, shared television shows, shared music that forms a worldview that I think a good employer capitalizes on rather than just tolerates. And that's what I think drove me to write the book. I feel like the boomers, the Xers, the millennials and Gen Zers were just putting up with each other rather than saying, what could I learn from you? What could I gain? from the hacker mindset that a Gen Zer has or the stories that a boomer has. Sometimes I think we're not getting together and uh, and there's that wall instead of the bridge. So that's really what what drove the book. So I have to say, and I, and, and I wanna, um, there's a couple of things that, that I get asked all the time. Like I haven't written this book. You wrote this book, right? Uh -huh. um, but as a person who helps leaders uh, all the time, the generational questions often come up, right? And yeah. so, so that led me to a couple of things that I wanted to ask you, uh, not just for me, but to help me in, when I'm helping others. And one of those is about how much of this is just about stage of life and age. Yeah, yeah, right. That's like because question. you know we're going through different stuff when we're in our 50s or 60s than yeah. we are when we're in our 30s than we are when we're in our 20s. <laughs> like, how much of it is just that? Like. You, you, and I, I don't have it. I don't think I have it highlighted here, but you um, share a paragraph that sounds like it could have been written last week. Yes, and I yes. often share a paragraph that people think often could have been written last week. Yours is from Socrates. Mine's yeah. from the 1850s. But yes. the point is the same. Like we're saying all this stuff and it's like some of it's not, not, is it all really different? How much of this is just age yeah. and, and different stages of life as opposed to, generations that so many yeah. want to talk about yeah it's a great question there is such a thing as ageism and chronocentricism which would be parents have always thought their kids are disrespectful or lazy or whatever you know but dating way back to socrates and plato what i think is different about this particular subject is based on the time frame with which a generation moves through history there are certain events that shape a worldview. I'll, I'll give you a vivid example that every one of your listeners will go, aha, that's a good example. In 2020, when we were not only sent home for COVID-19, but we began to see protests, as a whole, the millennial generation responded very differently than the boomer population to Black Lives Matter. We all believe Black Lives Matter, but boy, didn't we see a rift between the 26-year-old and the 66-year-old. So, yeah, that could always be true with 20-somethings and 60-somethings, but I think there are strengths that each generation brings with them, just like every person has a strength. And here's another analogy, Kevin, that I think might be helpful for your listeners. I know that all Democrats don't think alike and all Republicans don't think alike, but don't you learn a little bit about a person by how? Of course you do. So just knowing that someone might have been raised in the 80s and 90s, like a millennial, or the last two decades of the 21st century, boy, the mass shootings have shaped the worldview of Gen Z. The terrorism from day one in their life has shaped the thinking of Gen Z. It's different than me born in 1959. So that's what I think every employer, every leader, every manager ought to be capitalizing on. How do I get the very most out of not just the personality, gender, family of origin, 
skill set, but who they are generation. And I think it, when we get all five together, it's magic. So the other thing that's different uh, now and um, and continues to be is that we've got like five generations in the workplace together. And as we yeah. live longer, yeah, right? Like your your point is in part that because of these things that are shaping us and changes in technology yeah. and, and, and group experience and all those things, uh, that there are some differences and we've never experienced, certainly not ever, uh, yeah. five generations yeah. in the workplace together. And, and I think that's why as much as focusing on, well, what's different about this group or this group or this group yeah. makes this so very rich and important. And, and it gets to this idea of competitive advantage, which I want to get to, but I've got one more question I've got to okay. ask. I know you've been asked before that we've got to get to first, like how much of this, how do we, how do we make sure that we don't oversimplify? Yeah. How do yeah. we make sure that this doesn't just become stereotype? Yes. That yeah. is... That is often the message that I share. You got to get to know every individual. No this doubt. needs to be part of the context. But how do we make sure that we're not oversimplifying or stereotyping here? Yeah, it, it, by going deeper instead of giving up. Um, you're absolutely right. The easiest temptation to give into is to stereotype. We hear one story about some 18-year-old uh -huh. lazy slacker. Ah, they're fragile snowflakes. You know, we just draw that conclusion or all the millennials are narcissists, or all the Gen Xers are skeptical, or all the baby boomers are stubborn. You know, it, it's just what we do. But here's what's funny. We don't want to be stereotyped, but we do it. Yeah. So um, I really think the key is to go deeper. And I recommend in the book, The Art of Reverse Mentoring, where you get two completely different generations meeting together. The older has much to pour into the young, but the young, I think, has much to pour into the old. It's different categories of intelligence, fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. I talk about this in the book. So I meet every week with Andrew, who's 30 years younger than me, and Cam, who's 40 years younger than me. And I learn every time. We end up laughing until we cry because I poured into them some timeless sage wisdom you know, from yesteryear. And they're sharing me with me how we can use the latest app to market what we're doing. So you get the point. I'm, I'm kind of being silly here, but I just feel like we give up instead of go deep. We need to go deep and say, what does this young man or young woman bring to the table that if I just get past all the stereotypes, I realize, oh my gosh, we could use this. They have intuition on where the future is going. Yeah. So not only do they... I mean, every generation has a blind spot. Every generation yeah. has yeah. benefit. And, and so that not only can we, by going deeper, can we uh, learn from that generational point of view, but we can also get to know that person better yeah. and differently yeah. so we can lead them back to our the whole reason we're here. Uh, it really is to think about leadership. So uh, you tell a story in the book. Uh, and when I was reading this story, it was about this, guy asking his daughter to put the stamps on these on these yeah. envelopes <laughs> yeah. and she was youtubing how where the stamps go yeah and, and yeah. he was like freaked out yeah. this is my words not yours um yeah. and then he's then you say this one mistake i've made is expecting young team members to have the exact same experience i had at their yeah. age and so let's talk about that because i think that's a really like I can think of four times in the last week where that's come up for me and I don't yeah. need to bore everybody with the example. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll just take one. Like, okay. <laughs> like how can it be that I know I'm going to play the old man stay off my lawn card just to make this point. Right. Like how can okay. it be that someone who is in college can't read a clock with hands? Like how can yeah. that be? And yet yeah. if you think about how many clocks they've been, Incorporate and notice yeah. that they have, are that way. It's not very many. So that just is sort of like the stamp thing. Yeah. Um, talk about that because then yeah. I want to obviously get into this idea of tensions, but yeah. uh, talk about that point. Cause I think it's so very important, especially for those of you who are watching or listening that are of <clears throat> Tim and I's age. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, um, this happens all the time. And I think um, because technology changes, spe the speed of change changes. Um, I think we get locked into a way of doing things 
this is what becomes comfortable for us. And then as the whole world seems to be transforming into a new version of itself, we have gotten locked in. You and I have been in our careers now 30 to 40 years. So um, uh, the, one of the stories I tell in the book that I loved telling, because it's such a vivid picture of what I'm talking about, is the story of Tony. Tony worked for a major retail brand paint store while he was attending Ohio University. Love this story. Listen, yeah. everybody. Okay. So he liked his job. He loved his job, actually. It was a part-time job, but he started videotaping himself, mixing paint colors and just doing things while he was on the job. And he started a TikTok account in the process and began to go viral. So Tony gets 1.4 million followers. Uh, and he realizes, oh my gosh. And then, by the way, 37 million views. So he's got a truckload of people watching him. And he thought to himself, I should take this to my you know, management, to the executives. They, should, they could monetize this. They could use this for marketing. Here's another one and a half million people that might be, you know, cluing into what they're we not do. paying for. Yes, exactly. That they're not paying for. So Tony puts a slide deck together to make this presentation, takes it to the executives of this paint brand. And Tony does not get one person interested. Doesn't get one set of eyeballs looking at the slide deck. Tony did get something he didn't expect. Tony got fired. Yes. Yep. Because those older folks, let's be honest, thought he was, you know, stealing the paint from the paint store or doing this on company time or probably distracting to the customers. So he gets let go. Now, Tony moves to Florida from Ohio, now has over 2 million people following him, and he started his own paint store. Now, there's a lot to this story I'm sure we don't understand, but here's one thing I do understand. They missed a chance at a million and a half people that they could. Now, see, you, we all look at that and go, you idiots, but we're idiots sometimes when we miss this new, I don't know, newfangled idea that is trending. TikTok is trending. So anyway, I'll stop there, Kevin, but I feel like- well, I have to tell you a TikTok story now because I yes, saw this, this the other day uh, and there's these two guys and one guy says, okay, this is something that your parents and, that, and he was talking to someone who was in his, in his 20s, I think. This is something that pa your parents and grandparents did all the time that now only eight, 9% of people do. And they had this whole back and forth of what was it? And they went on and on and on and on. And then he kept getting, yeah. they gave hints and it actually what it came out to be was taking a bath. That's hilarious. I mean, think about it. There was a yeah. time like that's yeah. like when I was a kid. Yeah. W until I remember when we got a shower. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Right. Same here. And now there's a bunch of people. If you're listening to this live and you and, and you uh, if you don't have a if you don't have a bathtub in your house, just tell us. Uh, I would just like that because like that's all I had. And I'm not. Well, some might say so. But Tim, I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> you know, anyway. So um uh, we took a bathtub out of our house and replaced it with a shower. How about a bigger that? shower? Like, yeah. okay, anyway, yeah. you, you talk right. about, I think one of the, the, any, anytime I get the chance to talk to an author, uh, I know that we can't do every, we can't talk about everything in the book. And yeah. first of all, we don't yeah. want to, because we want people to go buy the book in this case, a new kind <laughs> of diversity by Tim Elmore. But, um, I always try to find things that I think are especially useful yeah. and valuable and and right following that story that that i led with a second ago you start to talk about preferences and expectations yeah and, and the idea that we really need to manage tensions and you say yeah. different experiences lead to unique expectations yeah. unique expectations lead to ongoing tensions yeah yeah so let's talk about this because i think this is a really important way for us to to get past our blind spot to say that's the difference yeah it really is. I'm so glad you brought this up, Kevin. So um, I'm talking to uh, HR executives and employers all the time who are saying they're interviewing young job candidates, maybe right out of college, that are that are very audacious. They're, they're bringing in a high sense of agency, asking for more money, asking for more flexibility. You know, this is just, this is our day. Uh, you know, it's, it's just the day. So um, I feel as though as we get to know new team members and hire new team members, I found a great quick way to summarize this. Everybody brings with them certain demands, meaning non-negotiables that they feel like they've got to have in this job. 
certain expectations, meaning I expect this to happen. It may or may not, but I expect it to. And then thirdly, preferences. I prefer this, but it's not a demand. I just prefer. I think those need to get out in the open right away, like in the job interview. We might ask about preferences, but you know what I found today, Kevin? This is just my experience, not everybody's. I think sometimes we voice preferences as if they're demands. We are screaming on social media. We are demanding the, you know, justice and cancel culture, whatever. I'm going, well, if that's just a preference, say it's a preference, you know? But I'm telling you, employers can help themselves by saying, is that just a preference or is that something? Because that's not going to happen here. And maybe I should show you to the door. If There's no sense in a continuous conversation. That's right. It's the exactly. difference between wants and needs. Right? Yes. I mean, there's yes. a lot of things I want, but that uh -huh. doesn't necessarily mean I, you know, and I love this idea of requirements versus preferences. And yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm a big believer in this, in, in, in setting clear expectations. Yeah. And yeah. I think what you're bringing to the table is, is the conversation about managing that there's a, there's a yeah. big tension and there's a huge yeah. tension right now, Tim. And I, I, I'm sure you're, you, you, I mean, I love your thoughts on this. There's a big tension uh, going on and has been for the last couple of years about, well, uh, employees have the, have the upper hand because, yeah. Yeah. you know, if we don't let them get what they want, then they're mm -hmm. going to leave. Yeah. And now, well, maybe that's going, maybe the pendulum is swung the other way. Or we're going to make you come back to the office. Yeah. 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 Darn it. Right. Like, so it's, it's a tension. It's an mm -hmm. absolute tension between um, the the wants and the wants and needs of one side and the wants and needs of the other. Yeah. But yeah. ultimately, if we can get it down to determining the difference between wants and needs, we can solve a lot of this. If we oh have a real gosh. conversation. Absolutely. Adam Grant calls what you just brought up the democratization of the workforce. There really is a flattening of, well, the employer needs that team member, but the team member needs the employer for the paycheck. But I'm, I'm telling you, Kevin, I know you believe this. It, the, the key is going to be trust. So when we when I interviewed members of each of these five generations and found out what they really want from the other generations, there were three common grounds, three common desires that every one of us have. If we'll lead with this, it might just be magical in the office. So number one is humility. Everyone, young and old, said, if you would approach me with a humble spirit rather than I know it all, uh, and humility basically communicates, I realize I've still got more to grow, more to go, you know, more to learn. Yep. The second one is respect. Um, that's an old fashioned word. Thank you, Aretha Franklin. But, you know, we all want to, we want to be led with respect. Uh, a lot of bosses I talk to say, well, they got to earn my respect. Maybe, but I think it's best to start with it. And then it tends to be reciprocated. If I lead that 22 year old right out of the University of Michigan, as he comes to me, and I lead with respect. Oh my gosh, it's a game changer. And then Kevin, the third one was curiosity. Every generation said, if I'm talking to somebody and they seem curious, like I, I want to grow, I want to learn, I want to, oh my gosh. So when I'm meeting with a with Cam, who's 40 years younger than me, but I'm curious with Cam, oh my gosh. Uh, I So Humility, respect, and curiosity. Every generation wants it. I know that seems almost like common sense, but I don't think it's very common today. And this might lubricate the friction that's going on or the tensions that are going on in some of our workplaces. I'll tell you what I love about that, Tim, is that those are three things that we talk about. And you you mentioned the word trust earlier, which I would put in there with respect. Respect yes, and trust, very yes. much connected. And the same yeah. thing. Do they need yeah. to earn it or am I going to grant it? Yeah, yeah. From there. Yeah. Um, I think if if that that I talk about those things all the time, yeah. not in the context of generation, yeah, because they are human wants and needs. And yeah. but I think thinking about it, if adding that layer of every generation wants and needs that from Z, from each other, yeah, uh, that adds another layer of understanding to it rather than just saying yeah. as humans, I as I want this from yeah. other humans, but I not only want this from other humans, I want this from other humans who are of a significantly different age than me. Yeah, yeah. Huge difference. No doubt about it. it. It is gigantic. I really hoped that this book, and still do, <laughs> but is like an encyclopedia where you don't have to read every page, but you might need chapters three and seven. You know, I need to learn about those Gen Zers and maybe, maybe about those Gen Xers or whatever. So my hope is it's just a reference guide that someone can go, oh my gosh, of course they might think this way. Look what they've been through. Look at the origin of their story. Um, so my mom and dad's generation entered the job thinking, just be grateful you got a job. They grew up during the Great Depression. 
I grew up in a very different time as a baby boomer. You know, I was large and in charge when I was growing up. So, and I won't continue, but I feel like this just helps us be better leaders because we're reading our people before we're leading our people. So one of the things that um, I think is worth us talking about a little bit is collaboration. Yeah. Uh, obviously, everything we've said will help in that regard. But what specific ideas, Tim, would you bring us around helping to create collaboration yeah. across the generations, specifically across the generations? Yeah. Um, what I talk about in the book is I, I, I spend a good chunk of time really talking about the development of emotional intelligence social and emotional intelligence. I know you're a big believer in that. I am too. It's it's the ability to, to read the air, to read the room. We, we always use that, read the room, and, and, and see who's in front of us before I bark at an order or just chime in with a thought that may completely be irrelevant to the listener. Uh, so I think that's going to help collaboration is I, I, I read, then heed, and then, and then I lead. I know that's cheesy, but I remember it. So um, I, I remember talking to a person not long ago who did a leadership training event in Japan, very different culture than America. She finished her presentation. She said, any questions? She waited for a few seconds. And when nobody raised their hand, she goes, okay, thank you very much. She walked off the stage. Her translator caught her backstage and said, oh, you missed a ton of questions. She said, no, I didn't. I, I asked, nobody raised their hand. He said, let me go back out there and ask again just watch. He went out there as a Japanese man and looked at these executives and said, does anybody have any questions? People, he said, yes, 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 yes. There were seven questions. And when he later debriefed with the, with the American worker, this gal, uh, he said, you need to know that Japanese people are not going to be like Americans. Hey, I got a question. You know, we're, we're flipping our hands up in the air, waving our hands. They just look up. And that signals with with you know face to face. I got a question, but it's but it's diplomatic. It's it's more quiet. It, you, you get the point. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we need to do this with our twenty somethings, with our thirty somethings, with our forty somethings. And I don't think generations is the only thing we need to know. There's a whole bunch of other stuff we need to know: strengths and gifts and skills. But I'm telling you, this is an elephant in the room that we all know is there. We just know how to talk about it. And I'm trying to push people to talk about this so we get it right. Yeah, I, I love that. And there's a, there's another thing that um, that you talk about in the book a little bit, and that is, you know, it, it, and and you know, I, I've got four of these generations on our team. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, we've been living this uh, for mm -hmm. some longish period of time, um, <laughs> and, uh, and and so I'm always interested in um, finding ways to facilitate the understanding across yeah. the group. Yeah. And, and, and uh, there's at least one or two places in the book where you talk about activities that we yes. can use. Yes. Uh, can you just look yeah. at our time? You can share one of those. I mean, there's some very quick things that you could do with your team, everybody yeah. that could help uh, in this, in this endeavor. So you have a suggestion for us? Absolutely. So I already mentioned reverse mentoring. We do that in our office and I highly recommend it. It's where an older and a younger generation person uh, meets up. They swap stories. Uh, you always find something in common. You and I found something in common about Danville, Indiana, just five minutes before this. So swap stories and then share your superpowers. The older generation is probably going to say something like, let me share how this company works. This might be helpful to you as a 22 year old, but then they switch hats. The mentee hat goes on the older, the mentor hat goes on the younger. And they're sharing again, maybe how to monetize the latest app that just came out or how to market better to my demographic that I'm a part of. Right. Uh, when I released the book, I sat down with the four generations in our office and I said, how would we market this book to Gen Z? How would we market it to millennials? How would we do it to the Xers, to the boomers? And all the different, they had different input there. One more quick idea, Kevin, that really has been fun. Um, Chip Conley, I talk about this in the book. Chip Conley uses the terms modern elders and young geniuses. I think every team has some modern elders that we need to respect and watch as modern elders. But these young geniuses that do have intuition, 
on where culture is going and where social media is going. Um, oh my gosh, I just, I, I just can hardly imagine what would happen if we actually started listening to each other and getting this thing right. So those would be just some of the some of the quick ideas that you can do without a lot of programming and start making bridges happen instead of walls. What a novel idea that we would actually listen to each other, everyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Chip, Chip, Chip has been on this podcast a long oh, time wow. ago. So, so if That's you're so cool. if you're watching now, you can go yeah. to remarkablepodcast.com and put That's in his great. name and you'll find it. Uh, but for those of you watching or listening later on the podcast, we'll put that in the show notes. We'll, we'll, we'll link to that episode that I did with Chip when we talked about modern elders is a big How part about of what we talked about. Um, so uh, we've all been through this common thing for the last three years, right? Yeah. Um, what, how has that, or has that changed any of this? How has the last three years changed improved, <laughs> worsened, however you want to say it, think about it. Like, has this helped or hindered us in this yeah. generational difference? Journey. Yeah. Stuff? Great question. Here's what the data says that I have been able to gather. Um, for the younger generations, that would be Gen Z, Generation Z, and the millennials, it's made them more hungry to get back because they're building social capital in their careers still. And if they're 26 years old, they're going, I don't have much social capital. I need to. I need to get with people. I can't really do it on Zoom. Um, for the older generations, there's always a mix in every one of them. But some of the boomers said, "Hey, this is kind of nice to stay in my sweatpants and work from home and not have to get out in the traffic." You know that sort of thing. So there's been less incentive for the older generations to come back. But here's what I do believe: in both children and adults, our social and emotional skill sets have diminished a bit. We got a little lazy, you know, look at us right now. We're on a screen. Now it's fun. It's fun for me. I'm glad to be here, but you know, you just don't get it all when you're not in person. That's my opinion. That's just me. But um, I feel like we're going to need to ramp back up for the kiddos as well as the adults. Let's do the work to read body language, to know what verbal, nonverbal and paraverbal uh, communication feels like and looks like. I just think good relationships are so key to good work. And uh, I feel like we're going to need to build those muscles again in, in our workplace. That's worth that's worth writing down, everybody. Good relationships are key to good work, which I yeah. completely agree with because yeah. we are not working on an island, right? Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. And I'm writing that down. Um, Kevin, so, while, you, while you write, can I mention one more thing? If sure. I think I mentioned this in the book. We are we are a lonely period of time in a lonely period of time. Yes, one hundred percent. More an people, epidemic of loneliness before a yes, pandemic. Yes, right? it's true. More people are dining alone, living alone, traveling alone, and again, I don't know. Are we just getting lazy socially? You know, to not do the things we used to do, the civic clubs and churches and other things, or or do we just want to be alone? But it's work to do the people stuff. And I'm saying, listeners, please learn to do the people stuff. It's it's just what makes life work. Speaking of the people stuff, a couple of other questions before we okay. finish. Okay. We shift gears, Tim. These All are right. the questions I ask every time I have a guest here. Okay. Uh, in part for that very reason. And the first one is the only thing you knew I was going to ask. What are you reading? Oh my gosh, I'm reading a couple of books right now. I got a stack on my nightstand. I have thoroughly enjoyed the book From Strength to Strength by Arthur Brooks. He's a Harvard instructor, a brilliant man. Has, I think he's got the most popular class at Harvard University, and it's on happiness. But in this book, he talks about the transition to the second half of your life and moving to make the very most of 40 plus. So anyway, that's a great, great, great book. I highly recommend it. And everybody I'm recommending it to says, oh my gosh, best book of the year. Strength to Strength. That would be one for sure. Um, I read uh, a book in 2018 that I'm rereading now called The Coddling of the American Mind uh, by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan Haidt is an NYU ethics professor, and they talk about how we are um, not doing a good service to the younger generations when we create safe places, well-intended, and we're not letting civil debate happen because you know, we might get triggered or canceled. 
And I'm thinking, no, 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 no. The university is a place where we need rigorous debate and civil argument. Um, so anyway, those two books will be two uh, of my faves. Uh, the Coddling of the American Mind and From Strength to Strength, everybody. And those will be in the show notes and on uh, remarkablepodcast.com later. So um, what do you do for fun? Oh, gosh. Well, I love movies. Uh, so um, we're, my wife and I are empty nesters. Uh, so we, we love to go see shows. Uh, we love to travel. Um, I'm traveling quite a bit and loving every minute of it. My wife's able to go with me since we are empty nesters. So, uh, and I absolutely love popcorn. I'm a popcorn addict, I think. So um, Indianapolis has a popcorn. Well, they did. I don't know if they got any popcorn vendor at the airport. They've got Just cheese pop corn. in. Yes. Yes. Love it. Okay. So Tim, one more thing that we have in okay. common. Are you ready okay. for this? I serve yeah. on the board of directors of the world's largest popcorn breeder in no. the um, in the world, yeah. No, okay, yes. Kevin. Yes. Okay, you're uh, my new BFF. All right. Um, <laughs> so now the question you've been wanting me to ask from the beginning, really, <laughs> okay. uh, like where can we learn more? Uh, I'm going to hold the book up again for people who are watching a new kind of diversity. Where can we people learn more? Where do you want to point yeah. them? I know you got something to, to share with them. So yeah, where do you yeah. want to point people? Well, there is a free assessment, listeners, that is really fun to take on how what your generational fluency is, okay? Are you fluent with Xers, Boomers, Millennials, Gen Zers, Alpha Generation? That would be the younger children. I have an appendix on that. So if you went to this site, you could take the free assessment. It's 41 questions and you get a report back on how well you connect with Gen Z, Millennials, Gen Xers, Boomers. Uh, the, New the, Diversity the, Book, for those of you who yes, can't. Yes, there you go. Newdiversitybook.com. Go ahead. That's it. Newdiversitybook.com. We'll get you the assessment, and then you'll have access to the book as well. And I hope it's helpful. Have you seen the game called Mind the Gap? Yes, I've got it. We play it in we our office. We played it at Christmas. It's so much fun. Yeah, so much fun. We played it at Christmas. Mind, we'll put great. that in the show notes too. Mind the Gap. I'm sure there's a site to this. We'll point yes, people to that as yes, well. Yes, exactly. Mind the Gap. So, uh, so newdiversitybook.com and growingleaders.com. Yep. The rest of your business yep. is yep. there. And so now a question for everyone who is watching and listening. And it's the question I ask you every week. And it is, now what? What action are you going to take as a result of this? It's fine to have enjoyed Tim and I's friendly banter, but far more valuable if you figure out what you're going to do with it. Like maybe yeah. you need to think about creating reverse mentoring on your team, or maybe you need to find a reverse mentor, or maybe you need to think about this idea of going deeper or understanding the differences between preferences mm -hmm. and requirements. Uh, and, or it, it could be any number of things yeah. that you took from this time, but until you take action on what you took, none of it will matter. Uh, Tim, thanks for being here. It was such a pleasure to have you. Kevin, it was a joy for me. We'll have to do it again. That's fine. I, I would like that. And so everybody, speaking of again, you know that I'll be back next week. For those of you who are live, I'll be back again later this week. But every week, another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. I hope you'll say um, hello in the future. I hope that you'll like it wherever you're listening. I hope you'll invite others to join us. Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Every week, we'll see you then. Thanks, everybody.